Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. So, um, you know, we've talked a ton about habitat, but if your goal again is, is having pheasants, quail on your property, um, if we follow this plan that you've kind of laid out today, is there anything, any big gaps in that food or anything else? Well, that, uh, uh, one more important? thing about CRP and, you know, the whole plan of what you're doing. The other thing you need to be prepared for is weed problems after that second year okay. or after that first year. And CP42 is going to be a culprit out there where there might be a few more weeds in there. And thistles, what everybody talks about. I can say without a doubt that if you've got any kind of decent planting at all, the prairie will outcompete the thistles. It's not like brome where they continue to grow. It will outcompete if you can stand it. If you can't stand that, one of the better ways that I know to control thistles in, in, in new CRP is... You, you mow it back, meaning mow it, you know, it starts to come up. And if, if, if you're an absentee landowner, this is miserable to try to take care of. But if you're there, you know, you're going to go out and you're going to mow those thistle patches in maybe July, you know. Uh, hopefully, if you're really on top of it, before they head out the first time. And then you're going to maybe mow them again in August as they start to head out. And mow them again in September. And so you've got five patches out there in that field that you've mowed back. What will happen is in October, the, the, the prairie goes dormant, and all the prairie plants are dormant, and those thistles are still green, and that's the time to spray them. And I use Milestone. I'm not trying to be a salesman, but that's been a, a good one. I, I'm starting to look around more for what's the next big name in killing thistles, but Milestone does a good job of not killing prairie plants. And it'll suppress some, and it'll hold some back, but you're not spraying the whole field. You're spraying just these patches where the thistle's at. And it's what I like about it, it's a one-time. And, and the reason, the big thing is, is that because milestone will tend to kill the thistles and everything else is dormant, the thing with 2,4-D is it kills everything. Or, you know, it really knocks back everything. So all you really do is open up a little spot in the dang area so that more thistles can come back in. Because any... You know, early successional plants going to try to get them up in that bare spot. So milestone doesn't do that as bad as as two four D, and it's a one time squirt. If you get it in the fall, you can usually take care. And it's a kill take. on contact. Uh, yeah. Well, I I you know, I'm sorry. We should call this show three dumb asses today. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly. Okay. But it works. Yes, it works. It works. You know, one of the things that, just to build on that. You know, my wife and I. So we. Had, tons of invasive species where we're talking autumn olive yeah. uh multiflora rose or now we're talking thistle what we do is we actually set out and we'll say hey tonight or this week we're going to focus on thistle yeah right because i mean if as you said i mean hey if you you got to look at the whole scheme and have a plan mm-hmm. you know, you can't eat it all at once and so we'll say hey we're going to focus on thistle and what we'll do is we'll go cut the heads off yeah. We'll cut all the heads off and burn them, mm-hmm. and then we will spray. Spot spray that spot. That plant. Yeah. And uh, right after we cut it, and um, we'll leave us. We'll leave the stem. We'll just cut the head off, mm-hmm. and we've had pretty good luck with that. I mean, that that seems to. You know, I'd say to that is just God love you. You know, I love it when I walk up. I'll get this from, you know, widow farmers. It'll say, well, I walked through that field and I just pulled every single one of them, and I'm like, oh. God, how do, yeah. you, do you do that? But there's, this is Iowa, and there's people that do that and and do it with a vengeance, you know? And if you want to go there, that's good for you. But some people can't. Sure. And some people won't, but mm-hmm. uh, that's that's the best. That's an A+. All right. <laughs> uh, that's that's great if you could go out and do that. And, but the, the thing about that is you can't, you, you can't go completely nuts because if you're going to start going after thistles like that, don't go after the mare's tail like that because there's 
10 times, there's 100 times more mare's tail out there probably. And, you know, you're just going to destroy your whole summer. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> gotta, I don't even know what mare's tail is. Research that yeah. for sure. But, uh, I'm sure I have it. Matt, is there anything, any gaps here that we haven't touched on today? No, or? I wanted to talk about the late, you know, uh, the, the, you know, s- spot spraying or, or mowing for weeds sure. in some of those. But that, I think we got a lot of it covered there. Okay. So oh, I, go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting here. Right, go ahead. Uh, gosh, I, I just got a couple of them here. So I know you're a big, you're a big uh, upland bird hunter. So what kind of dog do you have? I have wire hairs. Wire hairs. Yeah. Hmm. I've always had them back, way back when I first started, there was a guy at uh, Rathbun, and I'm going to forget his name, old technician down there that uh, had had wire hairs, and all of us that were kids at that time were starting to run them, and I had a good buddy over, uh, Mike Griffin, sold me my first dog for 40 bucks. I always like to tell the story because it took me three paychecks before I could pay him back. Completely for the <laughs> 40 pump. bucks, holy smokes. We weren't making a hell of a lot back then, but... uh uh yeah it was a you know it was just one of those things that was a she was an incredible dog that, and so i was i've been in love with them ever since and now this year i got a pup and uh that's why i'm so tired i didn't want to talk about the last week what i've been doing i say all i've been doing is sleeping because i don't have to run that dang dog every day I'm miserable long you know it's the first year and uh we just had fun you know i don't put any pressure on them the first year I just wanted to uh like bird hunting but that's tough on a an overweight fat guy, man. <laughs> oh, overweight old guy. But uh, we had a great, great year. So uh, we we both own Vishlas. Uh, love yeah, them. We did. We just we hunted last year. You never hear, see the show The Flush. Uh huh. Yeah, it's on Outdoor Channel or something. The guys works with pheasants forever. They were looking for public land hunts, and we've been doing some great things in Iowa over on the Missouri River, in the bottoms and in the Lus Hills, and it's been, actually been good quail hunting in those Lus Hills. Uh, lately, and it was traditionally always good. You kind of never knew about it, never hear about it. But they've got thousands of acres on the Missouri bottoms that they got walk-in for. When, when the river flooded five years ago, a lot of people went into CRP or Wetland Reserve, and it's all seeded, and a lot of them signed up in this public walk-in, and walk-in stuff. And from the Missouri border up to north of Missouri Valley, hell, there might be 15,000 acres of public land in there that you don't know about. And so we went out there and hunted. But anyhow, I'm sorry. I'll get no, no, no. It's all good. We were down in the bottoms. We were hunting in December. It was tough, but we were shooting birds. But you can imagine with a show, you know, they got to get good shots. And so they don't get good shots every time. I was amazed because that cameraman was unbelievable. with it. I don't know how he kept up with us the whole time. But we went over into Shelby County and hunted one day with a guy who is uh, all visualist. And they were just incredible. And we had one of those hunts that the, the, the Minnesotans that were with me, poor guys, you know, they just don't have anything. To, <laughs> the, you know, just the walleye? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. But uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a classic one where they were getting up all over the place and it was nuts. And those visuals, visuals were just unbelievable, fantastic in there. I had a good friend of mine who uh, turned me on to visuals. And uh, I call it gentleman hunting. Because we would go and uh, we would hunt an area near Victor, Iowa. Um, deep river, beautiful, a yeah. lot of birds over there. And literally, we would walk the grasslands with the guns over our shoulder with these vishlas working back and forth. And we'd have a conversation. We, I mean... I mean, it was probably oh, yeah. the most, it was the most for the point. Yeah, yeah, it was some of the most enjoyable hunting mm-hmm. that it's ever well, had. Looks like he's on point. We've been <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was sold. Tim, any other questions? I do have uh, so stock and bird. So, so we have. I've got, as Joel would say, hey, we've got we've gone through the planting. We've managed this this conservation uh, program that we've put in, and. Now, gosh, I'm I'm in my mid fifties. I don't want to wait forever to, for the birds to come. Stocking a good option, not a good option. Well, am I feeding? Am I feeding the predators? I used to be just absolutely nuts about this. You know, I'd get so ticked off, and I'd always blow up, and I just never could control myself. And I realized I have to become a better person <laughs> somehow. You don't have to. You choose no. to. So I yeah, that. yeah. But uh. <laughs> 
You know, what I, what I was seeing is a lot of guys your age or, even, or my age that have always done it right, you know, went, went and knocked on doors when you could knock on doors and get permission pretty easy, had time to do that. And, and that was starting to go away or their lives were getting so busy that it was harder to do. And so they started trying to work on Habitat. And then, you know, they bought their own place and they put in the habitat and the, and the birds weren't there. And, you know, they then it was stock, you know, and I it's like, God, this guy's invested a lot of money. He's doing the right thing. It's just not happening yet. You know, I've turned, I've, I've tended to back off. But what I want people to understand is that I've gone back and looked at damn near every bit of research in the Nebraska, in South Dakota, in Iowa, and it's not like I found five papers that maybe said there was a chance that it would work. I didn't find two papers. I never found a study that said that it worked. Now, don't like where this is headed. Yeah. <laughs> what I'll say is if you want to stock birds, stock the birds, but shoot them. Shoot the dang things. And, I, I, and that sounds a little crazy, but I, what I mean is they're not, you know, when you stock a bird, if a bird is a successful stocking, it's not getting through the first fall. It's getting through the first fall, getting to spring, and bringing off a successful nest. And that's where it just doesn't happen. They just don't make it. There was a, there was a, you've heard, you guys, if, if you're interested in it, you've heard of the bread hen thing. You know, we'll sell you bread hens. Yep. And what they'll do is they'll be broody. They'll go and sit on a nest and they're not going to run around and nothing's going to eat them. Well, South Dakota, first off, it's fallacy because what it is is everybody who sells birds, everybody wants roosters and they have to figure out what to do with. And they, you know, they, they sell plenty of hens, but they still got hens left over in the spring. They don't breed once and go sit on a nest. You know, they got to be bred every day and a half or something like that. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a period, you know, that they'd have to be bred. But the biggest thing is South Dakota took 100 and trapped 100 wild pheasants. And they took 100 of these bred hens. They stocked them in two different areas with similar habitat. First two weeks after stocking, death rate was relatively the same. Nearly 30% of the birds were dead after two weeks. And, and this could go on to a hunting thing too. But after that, the wild birds settled down Death rate dropped off to what was considered normal, and all the stock birds ended up dying. I think they had one bird in the one study, they had one bird get to spring. Didn't have a successful nest. Uh, Jesus. But, the, but, the, but the wild birds kind of just went back. Now you think about times in December when you're out driving the roads, and all of a sudden there's three goofy roosters sitting underneath a plum thicket looking around. I think what it is is those birds get... That's, that's a, another time when you see that. Somebody's been through some really good habitat, blew a bunch of birds out, and some of them flew so far that they're maybe not familiar with where they're at, and they're a little like a little mixed up for a while. And I still, you know, since I was a kid, I remember chasing those birds and going, what the, what the hell are they doing here? And I think that might be part of it. But the point is, is that it's really, really, really tough to try to stock birds. The other big thing with stock birds is they tend to move. And they tend to move at least a section in every direction. And so those 40 birds that you planted in that, you know, 60 acre field, well, you know, in three weeks, more than likely they're, they're a mile away from you in some direction. So you get, that, you get that movement too. So my point is, is not, you know, as bloodthirsty as it sounds to shoot them, but the idea is if you want to stock, stock them the night before you go out or two days before you go out and have it in fun hunt with guys like me or getting older, they can't move as much. And, you know, they can have a little idea of what it was like back in, you know, the 70s when yeah, they used to be able to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. So it sounds like my next foray will be as, as trying to figure out how to raise raise pheasants so I can... Quail. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, I'm not trying... I don't want to say like I've seen it all because I haven't, but... You know, the other one, the great one, was the surrogator for a few years. Do you remember that one? You could no. put the ch chicks in. It was kind of a big plastic box that developed out of Kansas. They were nuts about it. You know, it was like, this is the thing. And you'd raise the chicks, and they could go out, and they'd come back in, and you'd slowly kind of separate them a little bit, and then you'd let them go. And I used to see it. I'd go look at CRP fields for somebody. Yeah, you know, I'd see the tarp up on the hillside. I got a dang surrogator up there, you know, and we'd talk for a while about habitat, and I says, and I'd say, 
how's the surrogator working? You know, and you go, ah, oh, dang, the first year we really screwed up. It got too hot and we didn't ready for it. And they all died in the surrogator. But we thought we had maybe had the wrong, the wrong type of chicks, you know, or, or, you know, if you're going there, you're going with all different kinds of things. And they figured out to put a tarp over it to kind of cool things down a little bit. Uh, the next year, you know, the feed was wrong and they, they, they just didn't get them. They didn't make it, you know, and, and now we're trying something else this year. And, and uh, the University of Arkansas, or maybe it was Arkansas Game and Fish, uh, did a study. And on their surrogators, the quail that were released, they did not find a quail farther than 150 yards from the surrogator. Meaning after 100, I'm sorry, they did not find a quail farther than 150 yards. They were all dead, but not a single one of them made it farther <laughs> than 150. Yeah. yeah, because you're sitting there with this box. It's just like a big <clears throat> scent box. So that every critter in the world knows what it is. You let them out every day. So, you know, resident dang goss or a Cooper's hawk or something knows, damn knows where they're at. And, you know, they just, they just let them up when they let them go. Fast food. Yeah. 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 Montana, where there's poli it's kind of politics out there, but they still stock birds. Montana, for God's sake. And it was funny. They, they used to stock them at eight <laughs> weeks. But what would happen is they'd make it a big deal and they'd have an area where they stock them. All the people would come out. And the next day, they'd all come out to see, you know, they'd kick up some feathers or see where they were at. And they were finding so many dead ones that they moved it to 10 weeks before they started releasing them, the dang things. So, yeah, it's just, it's a tough subject. And, and you, dang it, you want it to happen. And it just, that's just not where it's going to happen at. So, your best chance is what I'm hearing is habitat. If you are going to raise birds or release birds, to hunt. It's, it's kind of to hunt. Yeah. And, uh, Hope, keep your fingers crossed and hope for the best on the habitat. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the most frustrating part is, you know, if, if we're back there around the 2011, 2012, I go back to that when there aren't any birds around and then waiting that maybe three years in Eastern, you guys have seen it, Eastern Iowa has seen it. We've lagged, you know, you go into Northwest Iowa, North Central Iowa, Southwest Iowa, there's a godly amount of pheasants out there. I mean, you know, in the right places, it's as good as it can get. But we have just lagged behind that. And it's coming, you know. It's, it, we're seeing more and more in Pale Polish County is good. And I-80 corridor is pretty darn good. You know, you can't beat that. But it's been slow in, in northeast and east Iowa, the, the, the return of them. And that's frustrating. All right. Matt, we're kind of getting towards the tail end here. We, we kind of have a tradition on the Midwest hunting and outdoors by two dumbasses of asking the last question. Um, you're an outdoorsman and a hunter. What... Uh, What's your craziest uh, hunting story that you can uh, share on air here? With? Can think of it as a dumbass moment. Yeah, dumbass moment. There are plenty of those. I say I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna die somewhere in South Dakota when I hit a jackrabbit hole and finally break my leg and can't crawl back to the car. <laughs> I did it. I, I mean, I I avoid those. I've had some terrible falls, and this year, tough going. I was on a public area and it was tough. And all of a sudden, the dog got birdie out in front of me and, and kind of went just over a hill where I couldn't see her. And I took off running, and I hit that jackrabbit hole. And well, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> yeah, it took a long time for me to get back up. And so first, I'm mad at the jackrabbit hole. I'm mad at my leg. I'm mad because I was running. And then I'm mad because I'm, I'm just harder to get up. <laughs> it's <so> bad. <laughs> but I, I think... That's a dumbass moment, but a great moment, I would say, is, is uh, when I moved up into Bremer County and we had a road from like Horton in Bremer County that went straight up through Elma up into, into Howard County. Well, at that time, uh, Chickasaw County had like 42,000 acres of CRP and Howard County had like 45,000 acres of CRP. I don't drive that road anymore because I have so many memories of greatest pheasant hunts you know you could ever ask for. You know, shooting a triple out of a dang, not just three birds getting up and shooting them, but birds in the air and shooting three of them. And just, you know, you'd go up in the morning on your way up and there'd be birds, you know, out all over the place. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost church-like for me. And I can't go back right now because I can't drive that road and, and try to see all those places and all the good times we had up there. It's, uh, you know... That's the way it goes. Yeah, you don't yep. hear Horton, Iowa brought up very much. No, you don't. Uh, you don't. <laughs> I went back one day. We had a, It was in the fall, and we had a good hunt. It was snowing. And I went back there, a little bar, and I stopped in. I said, well, let's see. I, I guess I'll get a hamburger. 
And honest to God, he walked over, took a took a ham, took some ground beef out, and he balled it up like a snowball. I'm like, well, that's interesting. What the hell's he doing there? You know? And he dropped it into a, a French fry cooker. <laughs> I was like, well, that, that's kind of something. I'll see what this is like. And then he pulled out two pieces of white bread, and he set them on a plate, and he brought that thing out, set it on there, and he took a piece of you know, cheese, set it on top, took the other piece of bread and pressed it together and handed it to me. I thought, bon oh, appetit. Baby, I'll tell you what, I've had some good fanging around here, but that's, that's going to be better than this. Huh? Yeesh. I found it. Find another place to find lunch. Yeah, that's horrible. That's horrible. <laughs> well, I think that uh, brings us to the end of our episode. But Matt, we want to thank you so much for joining us. What a yeah. what a great afternoon yeah. and some great stories yeah. and what a wealth of information. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, very thank much. you guys. It was yeah, fun. Thank you yeah. so much. You bet. Yep. But uh, Tim, we always close our episodes by you know, be safe, have, have fun, fun, and get yeah. outdoors. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.